Well, welcome. Good to have you here. There's going to be plenty of pizza tonight, right? First, I don't know if we've ever run out of pizza. Huh? That'd be a problem, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, welcome. Good to have you all here. I think there's some of us are new for the first time, but welcome, welcome. Um, grateful to have this guy presented tonight. We actually talked a little bit last, last week, the last one about Kubernetes, bringing up the cluster, identity, people, stuff like that. And then uh, Taylor was uh, afterwards saying, hey, I've got a guy that's really sharp about this stuff. He's been doing it for a long time. Maybe you like, in fact, I think you were talking about, like, are you going to do IAM? Who does IAM uh, navigation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I thought this would be a very interesting topic uh, for all of us. And uh, it's good to have you here. Oh, um, as always, uh, any other individuals would like to present, please let me know. We have another individual from Adobe, which is one of their architects that's going to come and talk about uh, security. And um, who went to the CNCF one uh, where Carson talked about some um, functions, open and open fast? So that was great. I mean, I'm going to ask, because I don't think there's yeah. a lot of crossover, but if we had him come back again, that was one of the best. Would you say, would, did you see it as well? I didn't see it. Carson. It's like five times in the last. So yeah, it's Carson's great. Months, so. Yeah, he's yeah, a great presenter. Yeah. So I'm going to see if I can get a hold of him, and maybe we'll do that either in June or July. But I, I think it would be a very good topic for a lot of us to come and talk about function, you know, serverless computing with inside of Kubernetes and some of the there. Yeah. I would think we'll all right, so take it away. We do have this, I guess, recorded. We'll put it on the Kubernetes meetup a couple of days. I'm trying to get my other stuff that I did with the uh, class source out. So I'm going to be a lot of you to do that. Um, and then, uh, with your permission, then also we're going to just uh, post this presentation as well out on our web. Yeah. Yeah, to you then. Only if it's good. Well, it's going to be great, right? He's also said, what, questions during the presentations? Uh, I'll, yeah, just stop me if you have a question. I'll try to remember to ask you about it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Anyway, right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Keelan Jackson. I'm a senior software engineer at Blue Matador. Uh, we're a startup in, I guess, South Jordan or so, just doing server monitoring in general. So that's, that's kind of our product. But yeah, I want to talk today about uh, AWS IAM Access and Kubernetes um, and some of the specific problems there and a couple of solutions you could use and shouldn't use. Um, so yeah. So uh, to start things off our agenda, I'll just I'll give a little bit of my background and then we'll talk about you know the current you know how IAM works not on Kubernetes, just a refresher there of like the world we're coming from, most of us. And then we'll talk about using IAM users, and then we'll talk about kube to iam specifically, and then I'll do a detailed uh, walkthrough of like setting up kube to iam in production, um, not just like theoretical, but like actual things you should make sure to remember to do. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I started off mostly at Lucid Software on the DevOps team there. Uh, and then I was there for a couple years, went to Telium in San Diego for a, a quick minute, and did some DevOps things with them, helped them with their uh, infrastructure automation. And, and then since about two years ago, or a little bit more than two years ago, I've been at Blue Matador uh, as employee number three, and I'm in charge of all the production infrastructure, Kubernetes, Amazon, all that stuff, and a lot of our backend system development. So the first thing we'll do is just a quick refresh on how IAM looks in like a traditional EC2 setup without Kubernetes. Um, so basically, if you remember like running microservices in EC2, you have a single app on a single instance in pretty much every case. That was how things were before containers, right? And you would run multiple instances in different AZs if you wanted high availability. And like the preferred way of controlling IAM access was with IAM roles. So you would have an instance with a single role and it would just, it would just declare all the permissions it needed. Amazon would negotiate that for you and everything is fine and easy. So here's a little diagram of that. Uh, pretty much takes 
not a lot to digest. There's just the instance, getting credentials, calling services. Any questions about that? No. All right, so the difference is using Kubernetes, we're going to be running multiple apps on each EC2 instance. So, you know, it's a very similar setup, except we're just doing more than one thing. And so it looks kind of like this. So you would have, say, multiple pods running on a single EC2 instance. They would have the role of the node. So say your node role is able to control uh, load balancers or whatever you did with COPS or EKS. And they would all share the same role to manage their IAM permissions. So you end up with a role that has permissions for different um, applications, like your web application, database, cache, whatever it is. So the, uh, the, the thing to realize here is that each node has permissions for the pods it's running, but because you, you don't normally know what pods will be on which nodes, every node needs all the permissions for any pod it could run. So you could end up with a node with way more permissions than what it really needs because it doesn't even have those pods. So you have like a, a secret one, you run one pod that has access to everything. Well, now all your nodes have to also have access to everything because it could run anywhere. So there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, the first concern that's probably the most obvious is that it violates the least privileged access principle. So the node has all these permissions that it doesn't need. All of the pods on that node have all those permissions, and that includes the pods uh, you're running, uh, code you control, any third-party pods, like say you're using Prometheus, a log management solution, those pods will also have those same permissions in a, in a typical setup. And then with, with uh, I'm going to say kubectl, I guess that they decided that's what it was. So kubectl makes it easy to install malicious pods. Uh, you know, especially if you have like a junior dev or someone with access to the cluster, maybe more access than they should, it's really easy for them to just accidentally run a pod that just says, hey, I'm going to list all your buckets, I'm going to list all the objects in them, and I'm going to send them to my infrastructure and do whatever I want with it. So that's probably not something you want to allow generally because it's just a huge security concern. Uh, could you guys think of any other uh, ways it violates this privilege? Probably not because I'm pretty thorough. All right. Uh, the other uh, issue that I didn't realize at first, it took me a minute to kind of fully understand why this was such a big deal, is that you really lose the ability to audit what's going on in your cluster if all your pods are using the same single role to do everything. For one, CloudTrail will log all the actions using that same role. So if you look in CloudTrail and see suspicious activity, you'll have a really hard time figuring out where that came from. Um, it's still possible. You could modify your client code, send extra parameters, uh, but it's not usually something people want to spend the time doing, and it's kind of counterintuitive to how IAM is supposed to work, right? It's the same reason we don't just use the root credentials for everything. The other thing that's difficult is if you're doing like a security audit or something and you have to answer questions like, well, does everything have only the access it needs or does this, does this privileged pod have limited access? Is your, is your PII data and your non-PII data actually separate? That becomes really difficult to answer because you'll end up with these really large policies encompassing all kinds of permissions across many services. And we're all in a hurry, and you, you know how the policies look. They look terrible. You'll end up just using stars everywhere, and next thing you know, you might as well just use the root credentials. The other thing that's kind of uh, maybe a niche area that you wouldn't really see often is uh, using deny becomes difficult in this way. Say you have like a security requirement to deny access between two services. Well, you can't do that now because the same policy has to allow access from someone else. So you get into these situations where now you're being forced to do weird things and you can't, you just don't have the flexibility that you're supposed to have with IAM. You're kind of losing all the benefits of IAM doing it this way. So I just wanted to give an example of one of these fun policies that you can go really quickly create. Redshift, IAM, ELB, all kinds of access, you know, random SQS things that all gets thrown together the resources star because, you know, who has time to figure out why production is down in five minutes? So 
you end up with these situations that you just kind of dig yourself into a corner, or back yourself into a corner, and it's hard to get out of because you couldn't answer, like, what could I remove from this in production? It's, it's, it becomes really tricky to do that kind of operation when all your pods use the same role. Does this uh, make sense so far, the, the problems with this? I think it should resonate probably with everyone. So let's go over the first solution. That's It's probably the easiest, or at least at first you're thinking, well, I'll just use IM users. And it, and it works pretty well, I guess. Uh, you can have a user for each service. They can have separate policies. You can manage all of those separately. It appears to solve all the problems I just introduced. Um, access will work great, no problems. You know, every, you can audit them in CloudTrail. Policies are easy, making changes. You can, you can uh, mitigate changes to unrelated services. Awesome. But you have to manage the access keys, and you should never do that. That's it's like the worst thing you'll want to do. They'll have to be rotated, which is a pain. Uh, just even getting the keys to the pods presents a lot of issues. Um, how are you going to get them there? Are they going to be hard coded? Well, that's not going to work. Uh, you don't want, you know, you don't want to give your devs opportunities to just log your credentials into GitHub or wherever. Uh, you can use environment variables, and you can try to use Kubernetes secrets to get them into environment variables. But Kubernetes secrets aren't encrypted by default. You'll have to do additional setup. And then because of the situation you're in, how, how are you going to authenticate that? And so it just, you just end up with this problem of managing the access keys, and that is not what we want to do. That's why roles exist, because you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, so I definitely don't recommend using IAM users to solve this problem, because it introduces more, more headaches than it's worth. Um, you know, just, just uh, answering those questions on the security questionnaire, like, are you rotating your keys? How do you do it? You know, what's the documented process? You don't want to do any of that if you can avoid it. Uh, do you guys have any any other thoughts about IAM users, good or bad, for this problem? Is anyone, anyone using the solution or not using the solution? <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is why we're here. It's Coop to IAM. So everyone, you know. They figured out a long time ago that IAM users are no good, using the node role is no good, and so people started coming up with solutions to this specifically for Amazon. So Kube2 IAM is one of those. How Kube2 IAM works, uh, it's basically a daemon set that intercepts the traffic to the EC2 metadata endpoint. So when the Amazon SDKs need access tokens, they call this local endpoint on the, on the EC2 instance, at least you know, in many configurations. You can force it to do whatever you want, but the, the main method is this way. And it uses that to exchange for credentials that are there and then authenticates the request. What this does is it intercepts that call because that call would return the credentials for the node role, which we don't want to have permissions. It intercepts that call and instead it calls uh, STS itself and assumes the role you need and returns those credentials. So it just kind of proxies uh, Amazon's APIs for you to handle authentication per pod. And of course, I have a diagram of it because that's the theme. So in this way, you basically, you, you can you go back to using IAM roles so you're not managing keys. And kube to iam does the work of assuming those roles on your behalf. So you can see, and you know, you have, uh, in this one I did multiple EC2 instances. You have kube 2 IM running on every node. It intercepts all the traffic, return, you know, calls STS for you, returns those credentials back to your application. Who doesn't know anything? You don't, you don't have to change anything. It thinks that it's getting the EC2 instance credentials like it used to. And then those are used to access the Amazon services. So there's a little bit more overhead, but it uh, seems to solve our problems. So it's auditable, again, uh, through CloudTrail or any other mechanism. You have separated the access so you can figure out who's doing what. It follows this privilege because you've separated it into separate policies. You can make changes that only affect one service. And you don't have to manage the keys that we introduce when we're using users. So you can still kind of rely on 
uh, I am to do all that work for you. And don't worry about the, you know, you get temporary credentials and they get rotated out kind of without you knowing. So it does a lot of those things for us. So features of Kube2 IAM. Um, there, there's, there's, there's multiple solutions for this. I just picked this one because it's one I'm using and I've had good experience with. It's very mature. Um, importantly, it works with all major CNIs, such as you know, Canal, Flannel, Weave, uh, the EN, Star ones that EKS uses. It works with EKS and OpenShift, um, which not all solutions do work with EKS. Uh, kind of a, they kind of piggyback this feature on with uh, the fact that it intercepts metadata is that it can also block metadata requests that aren't for credentials. So what you might not be aware of is any pod in your cluster, if you aren't using something like this, can just call the metadata API directly on the node and get, gather information. And that's something you probably don't want to allow. And one of the things they can do is just get the credentials directly from there. So um, it's kind of a neat feature that just blocks other things that aren't needed. Um, and you can, of course, whitelist ones you do need or however you need it. Uh, I found kube2im has a pretty easy migration path. So, uh, which was important to me trying to find a solution for production, because I actually don't care about this problem and anything but production really. And a lot of, some solutions are, can be kind of risky, right? Like you're wondering like, well, are my pods going to keep working right away? How do I get this to work? So with kube2im, one of the things I liked was you can specify a default role. So you can just use the, the, the role you were using and any pod that doesn't have a role will just continue using that while you work on migrating services individually. Uh, and so using this, you can restrict your node policy to only do assume role or other administrative tasks if you have them. Um, but there's no reason to, because you know, if you had other pods you know, doing things in AWS, they could have a role. So you can really just restrict the nodes to the single assume role. Um, and there's no changes in client code. It works with all the SDKs out of the box without issues, supposedly. I've only honestly tried it with like the CLI, Python, and Java and Go, that kind of thing. But it's, you know, very widely used, well supported. So I think I was, I'm breaking up the text with some graphs. So what I did was uh, when I actually deployed this in our production cluster, I decided to take some stats of the before and after. So this big spike here is uh, when I did, when I released like all of our pods one after another over and over to get everything migrated over. And you can see that everything seems fine. Like there's, you know, this is the little hiccup from deploy on these, these graphs. Network transmitted is fine. You're not seeing crazy amounts of API calls. CPU seems fine. There's nothing really weird going on. And uh, you wouldn't think this was important, but when I evaluated some other solutions, I actually did have large issues with this. Uh, uh, in fact, we almost like had a like downtime because of one of the other solutions. And I'll go into that later when I talk about other solutions. But so just you know, proof that it, it's fine. You can do it pretty safely. Okay, back to all the walls of text. So there's some drawbacks. So you're going to make API calls to assume role. And that can be slow sometimes. So uh, one of the things you may not know about STS is that by default, STS will use the global endpoints. There's like a global endpoint for it, um, kind of like how CloudFront works, Route 53. And it can be slow. So uh, one thing you have to do when you're configuring kube 2 IAM is make it use the regional endpoint if you would like that, and that can help a little bit, but there is still latency involved. Um, whenever you have to call a sumo, you have to wait for that, and then your API call happens, um, which is just slower than if it was going through the EC2 metadata as normal. Also, uh, if the kube 2 IAM agent on each node dies, then those credentials cannot be refreshed while it's dead, right? They will go through the normal path, well, sorry, no, they won't. They'll try to go through kube 2 im because you have an IP table rule set up and it will just fail. And so you'll be in this like bad situation. In practice, uh, I haven't seen it much at one time. One time I had this happen and then the pod just like restarted and it was fine because um, I have all my things set up really well. But uh, this is something that you should consider. It's not as foolproof as just going directly through the metadata API. The last thing to consider is uh, this: there's a raise condition on new nodes. So say you have autoscaler set up, 
you have a pod that can't be scheduled, so you bring up a new node, it gets scheduled on the node, kube 2 im gets scheduled on the node, as a daemon set, which one's going to run first, right? If kube 2 im is slow to start for some reason, then you won't be able to, again, get the credentials you need, because since before kube 2 im runs, it won't set up the IP table, so you'll actually be going through the old method for however long it takes, and then the IP table rule will exist, and then it will work. So that's something to consider um, if you're auto-scaling. Maybe you can come up with a way to delay your pods or something. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's one of the major complaints of kube 2 im is these two things, is that there's a race condition and that you're kind of dependent on it to exist. Is anyone here using kube 2 im that have run into these issues? Have you guys had anything like this? No. How about anything from you? Yeah. I think uh, if you look at the GitHub issues in the last year, especially, it's gotten a lot better. They've paid more attention, especially as the now competing tools have come up. So there's been a reason to kind of look more into these issues. Um, Yeah. And it, yeah. Yeah. So just uh, you'll want to look at the issues, the GitHub issues, and see if anything's going on. Probably do it in a test cluster before your production cluster to make sure it works with your workload and everything's fine. Um, but yeah, there, not everything is golden. There's some drawbacks. So. Now that we've gone over what it is and how it works, what I thought would be valuable is going through like a, the steps you would use in a real situation. So a lot of times these tools will tell you how to set it up and you're left to figure out, well, how do I set it up in my cluster? So this is what worked for me uh, multiple times because I was evaluating multiple tools and I had to kind of roll back and go forward. Um, so we'll just go through that if that's okay. I'm going to have a drink of water real quick. So the first thing you need is a policy on your Kubernetes nodes on the role that they're running as to allow them to assume the roles that your pods need. So normally when you're doing assume roles, it's just EC2 or Lambda or whoever assuming the role directly. Um, and you don't have to do config like this. But since you actually need another role to assume that role, you just have to set it up. So uh, don't use star. Um, I did that so it would fit on the slide. But you know, specify each role you want to use. Try to make your policy tight as possible so that you're not you know, running yourself into another corner where you have given too much access. So the corollary to this uh, on your node role is in your pod roles, um, you know, their policies will have whatever they have, S3, DynamoDB, whatever you're doing. But the trust relationship needs to allow your node role to assume it. So this is what I was just talking about, where normally you would just need this, right? The EC2 service can use the role. But because we're not actually doing it that way, you need to add that the node role can assume this role. So you kind of you have a, a role assuming a role. But it's not really that difficult to set up. Um, kube, 2, kube 2 im actually has a fairly easy solution compared to one of the other solutions where there's like even more roles, assuming roles, and those, you get lost. But just one level here, not too bad. Any questions about that, about the trust relationship? Or it might be called an assume role policy, like in Terraform or something. Make sense? All right. Now, this is uh, on, on each pod in your annotations, which you might not have, so you just add annotations. All you got to do is add this annotation with the name or ARN of the role. So kube 2 im uh, can auto-discover the base ARN, so you don't have to have you know, your the same 30 characters everywhere. Uh, or you can specify the full ARN, especially if you need to do cross-account roles. You can, it supports that. You just need to specify the full R in here for the other account. And then, again, make sure that these are set up correctly, which can be a little more tricky. So it's actually quite simple to set up your new pods this way. So 
Oh yeah, one more thing. So you know, the you have to, it uses our back because you know we're on what 112 or something. So everyone uses our back. It's really really quite a simple policy. It's just getting and listing pods. It basically it uses that to get your pod IP addresses and map those to the annotations. That way, when it's intercepting the <clears throat> metadata requests, it can figure out which roles go to which pods. So that's that's how that works. So our migration strategy. Uh, when I was doing this, I did not want to migrate like active like production pods, even though I was sure it would work. Um, and I also didn't want to put Kube2IM on a node that had running pods because it modifies IP tables and intercepts all the traffic. So I wasn't sure if you know everything on that node was ready to be doing that. So the migration strategy I came up with, up with that I feel is very safe was to just add a new node and not allow anything to schedule on it. And then I could run pods specifically on that node to test what I'm doing before I rolled them out to the entire cluster. So we'll just go through that step by step. So you create a node, however you do that. Whatever you're using, use that to create one more node. And then after it's ready, you just taint the node with this no schedule key. And I just named it kube2im, so it was unique. So basically what you're saying is you're adding a node to the cluster and nothing can run on it. Um, and you don't want anything to tolerate this because you don't want anything to run on it and have their permissions messed up. Then what you do is you can you deploy kube to IAM just to that node. So you can specify the node name here. Oh, can you guys even, yeah, you can see the mouse. So you specify the node name so it just runs only on that node. It won't run on your other nodes. And then because you've added this new schedule, you have to you have to add a toleration so that it will run on that node and won't get just stuck pending. Um, so this is the full config for like for the daemon set. Uh, those are the important things for this migration strategy, but there's also um, these options you add. So probably the most important option is this host interface. Uh, you set this to whatever CNI you're using. So if you're using Weave, it's Weave. If you're using other ones, it's whatever it says on GitHub. There's a table of them. Um, and this does work with EKS and uh, all the major CNIs. So, you just have to specify those two things and whatever other what, whatever other options you need. So you want to probably have it manage IP tables or else you'd be managing that manually, which I don't want to do. And then you just have to tell it its host IP, which you get from the uh, downward API here. Um, and it does run in a privileged security context and on the host network. Um, so there's that. That could be a negative for you too. Uh, but again, it's really widely used. You can look at it. It's open source. Nothing weird going on there. And, and as, as was pointed out, uh, you should pick a version that's not got a lot of bugs open on it, if you could. That would probably be in your best interest. Well, 0.4. 4, OK. Um, the Those are the ones you're having issues with? I think I had an issue with. Uh, seven and I went down to six and it was fine, but it probably was just that I redeployed and it was fine. So yeah, this yeah, yeah. So we're gonna yeah, you want to roll back and not roll forward on this one. Uh, any questions about this config or what the different options mean or most of it's boilerplate, but just a few key things there. All right. So then next, you want to deploy a test pod. And so I just, you know, Googled a pod, you know, a Docker image that has the CLI installed and use that. So basically the same thing, you just tell it to run on that one node and to tolerate that uh, no schedule. And then you just annotate it with the role you want to test. So I, I was very thorough and I tested every single role I was going to use to make sure that it had the permissions I needed. Yeah. Do you have a new kind of naming convention? Sorry, for my what? For your role names? Uh, I name them after the service they are. Uh, we only we have like what ten? No, less than ten services. No, it's more than that because of all the jobs. So there's like twenty of them. I just name them exactly how they're named uh, for the service name, but I'm no I'm no expert at naming.
Yeah. No, I wasn't. Uh, so right now you have your option of deciding what allows you to assume the role. Yeah. There's another option to That's right, I forgot about that one. Specify that you want to control the roles as specified within the room space. So um, you can do that with the roles that you want to So yeah, I forgot to include that. They do have the, the namespace security feature. Uh, I forgot they had it because I know KIM has that, and I it's important there because you have to do it. But in Kube 2 IM, it's optional. Um, so yeah, that's right. So you don't you don't have to use a naming convention, I guess, is the point. Because in that config, you can just list them all in a giant regex or something. All right, so yeah, you just exec into the container and then run the commands you want to test. So you definitely want to run like your critical ones, the ones that are going to be called the most frequently, but also make sure that it can't run the ones that it shouldn't be able to run so that you know that you're not getting the old node role. Because in this point, your node role still probably has all the permissions because you're just migrating to the solution. So you just need to make sure that it can't access things that it shouldn't. And then you'll know that kube 2 im is working correctly. And then, you know, once you've, you just repeat that for every role you want to test or until you're comfortable, and then you can just change your config, remove the, the node name spec specification and the tolerations, and deploy kube 2 im across your cluster. And then you can roll out uh, your services one at a time with the annotation added, or you could have done that earlier. It wouldn't have affected it before kube 2 IM is running. So you're kind of flexible. There's a lot of flexibility there. Um, one thing I will mention is if you need to roll back on kube 2 IM, it will not delete the IP table rule. Uh, you'll have to go in on the host into IP tables, learn how to use that again, and then delete it yourself. And uh, actually, I wrote like a blog series about all this, and I, I put the specific commands in there because it was actually a, a pain to remember how to do all those things. Anyways, when you're done, you can delete the node that you added and the testing pod, and then clean up your node permissions when, you're, when you feel comfortable that everything's running correctly and you're really sure that it's ready. And that's it. So uh, any questions about uh, Kube2IM specifically, or we could talk about more features? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And you can you can increase the log level here. I think it's I put it to info. Um, I bet debug would work. <laughs> so uh, or verbose even. I'm not sure if they how many Vs you have to add, but um, that's a good point. The log should be should be helpful. Yeah. 
and they're all requesting the same thing. It's just having to go outside every time to get it versus just get it once and then it's sort of all Yeah, so yeah, there, it does not have caching, I don't think. That's one of the main complaints about it. Um, but remember that the, the role credentials are valid for, like, I think the default's like 15 minutes, but you can configure that, I think, it could join in. And so really, each pod would only need to go once every 15 minutes, but you're right. On the same node, it would just do it again, over and over. Right. And, and that's actually, I think that's another complaint people have, is that on really, really big clusters, that can be an issue, where if you had like 100 of the same pod running, and it all went at once, you could kill Kube to IAM pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I just I don't I don't know why they haven't done it. Do you? Do you? Yeah, that, yeah, you got a question? Uh, so you, I mean, you, you're free to create a role that has more access and, is, and annotate it in, in any pod from a cron job or deployment or daemon set or anything. Um, are you saying like, would you want the node to ever have more access? Yeah, I mean, it, it would inherit whatever access that the, assuming it's running in a pod, it would inherit whatever access. Well, you, so what you could do, I mean, if you're assuming you're writing some script to manage this, you could just call STS directly too. So say you have permission to like assume that role or something, you could do that just for one command or something on a pod. Yeah, it would. Uh, as it relates to IAM, I, you could do whatever you can do with a role, uh, but I'm not sure. What else you would mean? Does anyone else want to jump in? Not really. I, I mean, like for the the idea of if you had like a privileged pod that only certain users could access, like if say it's in a different namespace and you've done the namespace access, you could do it that way. It seems like whatever role scheme you did from the start out, you would be using my bit all by building stuff in each one of you. And in order to keep yourself out, you know, you do this. And sometimes it may be done temporarily, but not really. Uh, you, you could. I imagine you would just, you know, re-architect your service into two services that had different access requirements mm -hmm. or something like that. Like, say you had, like, admin endpoints and you, those needed more privileges, then they, would, they could run as a separate service that only ran those that had the access all the time or something like that. But, yeah, this is basically confined to just how pods could work. So if it's all at the pod level. Whatever you're doing in a pod, that's what would work with group 2 IAM. Does that make sense? Uh, no, I don't, I don't use Prometheus. <laughs> I use Blue Matador, so. Well, let's say you stake for other reasons, but out of your IAM or do you just get the breaks 
yeah, that's that's probably how I'd approach it in our cluster. And I, I, like we have our own metrics for the app, then if those are fine, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be useful. I could see that being interesting, especially if you're running into like an issue with the number of, like if you're hitting like an API limit in Amazon. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, so let's let's go to the, the other solutions because we were already kind of talking about that. So these are the two solutions I'm really interested in. Uh, so there's KIAM, uh, uh, and basically how it works is it has an agent like Kube 2 IAM that only runs on worker nodes. And then it has a server process that runs on your master nodes. And the server process is the one that interacts with STS and does the assume roll calls, and it caches the roles, and it handles all of that. And all the agents do is intercept the metadata calls and then call the server to get um, credentials. And uh, it solves some of the problems that brought up by kube 2 im like the issues with uh, scaling or having many, many pods with the same role. Because now you're only going to have a single assume roll call per 15 minutes or whatever. And then it will just return that one credentials to everyone. Uh, the other cool thing it does is it prefetches the credentials. So say you have a pod coming up that's not yet ready, but it sees that annotation, it will just prefetch those credentials and they're ready to go. So it's really cool. Uh, the reason I don't use it is because I had a crazy problem with it. Um, specific to the Java SDK, where the default time, the Java SDK, for some reason, it's not the same as the others, and I didn't know this until this happened. It would request a role for 15 minutes, and then the default settings in KIAM would say that if a role is expiring within 15 minutes, ask for credentials again. And so it was just uh, infinitely asking for credentials, and it took me like five minutes to figure out the Something was weird and it was just a pain. I didn't figure out the solution until after I had given up on it and just killed it and moved back to Kube 2 IAM. But assuming you don't have something like that happen, uh, KIAM probably would be a great solution. The other caveat to it is that uh, on EKS or any setup where you don't have the master nodes, you'll have to do extra config or handle it some way because basically in the KIAM model, only the master nodes can assume the roles and the worker nodes can't do that. So you'll have to kind of merge those into one process and run them on each other. But you run into an issue where uh, the agent is you know, intercepting the metadata calls, but the server process needs the actual metadata calls to still call the real thing, the real deal. So I don't know how people are solving that with, like, with EKS, but that's something to consider. You'll have to mess with it to make it work. Um, and then the other solution uh, that I found but isn't production ready is Kube AWS IAM Authenticator. And the proof of concept here is that you would run a single pod that's in charge of credentials and it will expose temporary credentials as secrets, Kubernetes secrets, that are then mounted in the pods. And I, I haven't seen any work on it for a few months. Uh, it's a, I like the idea a lot if they can iron out all the kinks, <clears throat> all the kinks around secret access and making sure that a, you know, a single pod can handle the, whatever you need to do. But that's another one I would look out for. Have you guys used any other tools or these tools and had success or failure? Have you used KIM before? Yes. Um, it can be hard to get installed because it's a major service. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you just reminded me. So part of KIM that was, and if you go into like the Slack channel, like in the Kubernetes Slack, this is like the only question is for this one thing. They've set up mutual TLS between the server and the agent so that no one could look at the things, I guess. But the problem is they don't provide any instructions on how to actually do that. And so, they, and they recommend using a, whatever, what's it called, cert manager, cert manager, with no help on how to configure it. And then of course, the most recent version of cert manager doesn't work with uh, IP address only certs. So 
real, real pain. And I, in, the, in the blog where I go over KIM, I also go over that. Um, so yeah, much harder to set up. And not, I'm not even sure you can set it up in EKS without making some serious compromises to the whole point of it. So. Uh, they, <laughs> someone at the KIM project thought that using localhost was evil and changed it to 127.0.0.1 everywhere. And then at the same time, Sir Manager at the time didn't have the ability to issue search for that correctly. So it's just a pain. They weren't compatible for, this still might not be, I'm not even sure. So you get around it by just using localhost again, but yeah. All right. Yeah, on the the master nodes don't have the IP table rule, so any pods running on the master nodes would be able to still access the metadata endpoint. Um, and there's legitimate reasons to run pods on those, and they wouldn't get the benefits of it either. So it's kind of, yeah, it, you know, ups and downs. Yeah. So both of these uh, are for Amazon and Amazon. I imagine. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't. Yeah, like I, don't, I don't use Azure or Google, uh, what's it called, G, GCP. That's right, yeah. If you if you need access to other clouds, you would have to use a different solution, because these don't, these are specifically for AWS. Um, so that could be an issue, especially because I think GCP and EC2 share the same metadata structure, so you could have a real issue there if you need both somehow, so. At that point, you're probably looking at managing it in your code, more than likely, because it's just not quite there yet in the open source world. Um, and that's all I had, I think. So if you have you know, any other discussion or questions, we can go over that. Right, so an issue you want to first get this set up. Somebody else might get this, so if you have to answer for it, like you want to So I had a cluster set up. I have my trust policy in place. and. Uh, I got my first app working, but I misconfigured one of the main spaces. So I took it down, and the, uh, it was the role, um, the cluster role, the R for it in AWS changed to just a random, what appeared to be a random number. It's no longer associated with my cluster role. And when I restarted the cluster, even though it had the same R again, the actual trust policy still had that old number, not the new updated trust policy. I had to go in manually and actually basically delete it and re edit again. Uh, I don't know if you could counter that or have one. What behavior caused that? No, I have not seen that. Uh, do you have any like config management that would be overriding your changes? No, no, it looks like it was on the AWS side. So, like, when that R gets deleted, it's like there's some kind of symbolic representation behind the scenes of what that R actually refers to. And it doesn't resync. Oh, okay. So, but I just don't know any solution around that. It's not really an issue if you're running for up because it's never going to get rid of the policy. But right. If you're in a dev environment and trying to get for the first time, you might get it. It's a little frustrating. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I haven't ran into that. Uh, so, what, how did you fix it? You just. I just deleted the trust policy and then re uploaded it again. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you use, uh, are you using the console or like Terraform oh. or Cloud, cloud Formation? Console. Yeah, I ran into that. One other issue I ran into, well, mostly is mostly with KIM as the issues I had. It's really hard to set up. So if you're going to try it out, give yourself like a whole an entire day just to do that because it is painful and slow. Um, but yeah, like I think I mentioned this already, deleting the IP table rules, you have to go in and do that yourself. That's not, a, and even in KIM, who, who they delete it automatically, there's a race condition there still. So you might need to go in and do that to undo changes to that. So any of these things that modify IP tables or run on the host network, just double check everything if you're going to undo it. That's, that would be my advice there. Yeah, if there's nothing else, then that's it.
I think at the end of this, uh, we'll send out the slides, I assume, but there's just some resources. I wrote a blog series about the, you know, cube 2 IN, KIN, comparing them and all that stuff. So you could read that if you wanted to. But yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah.